Now, K-pop has been taking the world by storm and its popularity hasn't been held back by the global COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, amid the global lockdowns and the restrictions faced in everyday life, new releases from the likes of Blackpink, BTS and Seventeen are giving fans around the world much to look forward to. There have also been online concerts by K-pop artists that have been massively successful. To discuss what's happening in the world of K-pop, we connect with Stephen Lee, an American journalist and author who will release a book called K-pop Confidential this autumn. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Stephen. Uh, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Well, my first question to you, BTS it recently held its Bang Bang Con, um, which was the biggest paid online concert ever held anywhere in the world. Do you think that the quality of the performance and the online format really delivered? Yes, I think whatever is lost without the live presence, um, there are other things that you can gain from being completely online. So Bang Bang Con the Live was very special because it took place on BTS's seventh anniversary since their debut. And that's very meaningful because seven is a lucky number and also because seven is how long a lot of K-pop contracts last and not a lot of groups reach that milestone. So it was very personal, it was very intimate. There was still fan interaction online. And one of the coolest things in um, you know, normal K-pop concerts is seeing that sea of light sticks that all the fans kind of wave in, um, in motion. And they found a really great way to represent that by like having a chart where um, you could see where fans were turning their lights on at home. And they still had really great innovative performances like Boy With Love with umbrellas lit up with LED lights. So it felt different. It felt more intimate, but still for every all of the 750K people who um, watched it, it felt like a really satisfying experience. Well, it was very surprising how the energy just could burst out of the screens there while you would think that yeah. you know, the energy would rather be limited. But throughout this uh, pandemic, the worldwide fervor for K-pop seems to have continued, um, as made obvious by these concerts. And of course, there were many different theories until now and uh, different analyses on why BTS really took off in the global music industry. But what's your point of view? Yeah, so BTS is a phenomenon. I don't think there's any denying that. So kind of by definition, you can't really define a phenomenon in words, but I'll try it anyway. Um, but I think, first of all, BTS really took off across the world because I think that their talent really shines through in a, in a way that I think people who don't know a lot about K-pop sometimes might have some preconceived notions of it, like all the artists are singing other people's words or doing other people's choreography perfectly. But um, I think you can really see that the talent is authentic and a lot of the artistry comes from the members of BTS themselves. And also with every music video, every live performance, um, every hit record, you can see, you can really tell that they put that extra effort in there to make it not just popular, but enduring. And another thing about BTS that makes them so special is they have a unique ability to speak to fans really authentically and sincerely um, and make each of their fans like feel, feel like very special in their own way. Um, so I think like if you were to kind of break it down, I think it's their talent, it's their innovation and their authenticity. Mm -hmm. And do you think there are perhaps more elements of K-pop or perhaps some groups you think deserve more attention? Yes. So BTS's success is global and it's real and it's here to stay and it's great. But I would also love to see more girl groups kind of reach their level. And I think we're going to see a lot of girl groups in the coming years um, really hit the top of the charts as well across the world. Um, we're seeing that with Blackpink's comeback. And there are really so many others like Itzy and... Um, Twice and Mamamoo and Red Velvet and so many others that I think um, deserve more of a following around the world. Well, fans in the United States where you are, they haven't just banded together in their love for K-pop songs, but they've become involved in massive Black Lives Matter fundraising efforts. They've intervened in mm -hmm. some political affairs and they've drowned out racist Twitter posts, uh, for instance. They're really becoming this 
big political force to be reckoned with. What do you think has really enabled them to come together as this massive political force? So a lot of American media is very surprised that K-pop fans have made such meaningful impact. But I don't think it should be too surprising because I think the K-pop fandom is really unique in that it's so global. Uh, Korean, the Korean um, entertainment industry has made so many great inroads to um, audiences around the world for so many years that the followers are very diverse. Um, they come from all sorts of backgrounds. So it's a very inclusive, it can be a very inclusive group of people. So I think that they're also good at mobilizing for a cause. And often the cause might be making sure that the streams of a certain new video get up to a billion or, um, you know, make a certain hashtag trend. But I think turning that into social action um, is just very fitting because I think they're used to banding together for a common cause. And I think it also speaks to the, the way K-pop spreads the Korean spirit of maybe more um, collective action, um, it, even in more Western individualistic areas. So I think it's a uh, very cool to see, and I don't think we should be all that surprised. Well, do you think people's perception of K-pop has changed them as a result? I think so. I mean, there's so many inroads that K-pop has been making, um, especially in the States. Um, I think the perception that K-pop is any one thing or that there's only one type of fan is really diminishing. And I think previously, a lot of um, Western media would only focus on certain aspects of the industry or like whenever there was any kind of scandal. But I think they're just seeing that how how much of a source of good and how positive a lot of the messages are that are coming from it and from the artists themselves. Well, you're releasing a book in September and it's called K-Pop Confidential. And we know so far that it's about a Korean American girl who aspires to be a K-Pop singer. What made you want to write this book? So I really wanted to write a K-pop novel that had the theme of learning your own value, um, no matter how much criticism you get, because I think K-pop and the K-pop trainee um, system is a metaphor for, um, you know, all sorts of different experiences that young people have because the standards for K-pop are so high. You know, you have to look great, you have to move perfectly, you have to sing great, um, you have to behave well. Um, so there's so many ways in which um, people who get into the industry might feel that they don't measure up. So I want, wanted my book to be about how um, you can find your own value outside of what anyone can say. Um, so I really wanted to tell the story of a Korean American Girl because um, I really wanted to have an outsider's perspective because I wanted a lot of people who weren't already K-pop fans to discover this book. So it's about uh, a main character named Candace Park, who um, is a shy, quiet, studious girl who can sing, but she's too afraid to sing in public. But she gets convinced by her friends to audition for a global um, K-pop uh, company behind the biggest K-pop boy group in the world who are looking for their first girl group. And she actually passes the audition and convinces her very strict parents to let her go and train for a summer. And it's a lot harder than she thought it would be, but it's also a lot more life-changing than she thought it would be. Oh, well, uh, you briefly mentioned that there are some aspects of K-pop that we might ne not necessarily uh, think about. And, well, um, K-pop does seem at most times very positive and the musicians themselves, they seem very upbeat and happy. But what are some aspects of yeah. the industry that you think really needs to change? Well, um, just like any competitive industry, there are things that really need to change um, and that can be improved. And... I think in recent years, there have been um, a lot of great movements towards that. Um, I do think that, of course, the standards for um, appearances and um, a lot of how, and how hard um, these very young people are worked um, needs to change. And also the, that desire for perfection is um, way too much to ask for. But 
Um, so I do think that there should be a little more room for, you know, people to make mistakes, people to not look a certain way, you know, because there are all sorts of people. Um, and, but I also just don't think that this is a specific problem to K-pop or um, certainly not um, Korean culture. I think these sorts of um, issues arise all over the world whenever there are high expectations put on young people by kind of the generation before them, like competitive sports or getting into colleges or um, trying to present a perfect image online. Like there's such pressure that I wanted this book to not only talk about K-pop, but for anyone who's ever experienced any of those other more um, common experiences can relate to. Well, what was the main message that you hope to convey to your readers through your story? Well, in addition to what I was talking about before, about finding your inherent value, um, I also wanted to really celebrate K-pop because um, I, even though the book explores the dark sides, I also wanted to explore what's really fun, what's really unique, um, what's so creative about this world. And I also really wanted to celebrate Korea because I think there's just so much interest in Korea and I wanted to show how fun it could be um, what adventure you can find there you know once it's safe to visit again um, and I also wanted to celebrate some of the um, the spirit of Korea too um, just the hard work the um, you know the the way to ri the way that Koreans are able to rise up um, against a lot of adversity so I just wanted to make it, and obviously the food. <laughs> so I just really wanted to celebrate both K-pop and Korean culture for an audience that might not um, be familiar with either. Well, speaking of some fun stories, and well, we can't let you go without hearing some scoop there. So are there any <laughs> fun stories or some little known facts about K-pop that you've uh, uncovered during your years of covering the industry? Well, um, in a lot of my research just in terms of my journalism career and also for this book, um, well, this book is aimed at a younger audience, and you can see it right here. Um, it's a very fun cover. <laughs> um, but of course, like readers and also fans are really um, interested in romance. And if you know anything about the K-pop industry, you know that it's not easy for idols to date, and they usually can't do it publicly. So I've read and heard a lot of um, really fascinating stories about ways that idols can flirt with each other, even when they're being watched by their managers. I've heard of um, idols when they're backstage at music shows, like handing sandwiches to each other that have their phone numbers or their cacao in it. Um, and I have a lot of fun with that in the book because I think for teenagers, it's really entertaining to see kind of forbidden love, and there's so much of that naturally in K-pop. <laughs> well, that's something else for the fans to go wild about, I suppose. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to let you go now, Stephen, but it was wonderful talking to you. Stephen Lee, as a oh, thank you so much. journalist based in America, joining us this morning. Don't miss this book, K-pop Confidential, out in bookstores this September. Thank you so much for joining us, Stephen. <laughs> thank you. Well, this is where we wrap up the show and also end this week. Thank you for tuning in. Have a lovely weekend wherever you are. Goodbye.